I'm really excited about this talk because this is a new talk. Um, and it's kind of a, not evolution because you're not supposed to say that, um, but about things that are not actually evolution. Um, this is kind of an outcome of last year's talk, kind of growing on that talk. Um, we talk, I talked about reach and how to reach more people by making your apps more accessible, um, by making them work for more people on more devices in more contexts. Uh, and this year, and after that, I had a lot of feedback and a lot of thinking and researching, and we're at universal design now, so let's dig in. Um, if you don't know me, Mel I'm Melanie Sumner. I am a senior software engineer at HashCorp uh, on the design systems team. So it's my job to make really awesome components that engineers love to use in their Ember apps um, and make them accessible, not by default, but pretty much by default, as much as we can. Um, and you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at A11YMel. Um, before I thank HashiCorp, I want to thank my husband, Joseph, who's my partner and my best friend and taking care of everything in the States while I'm here. And I really couldn't do this without his support and him being an awesome partner. So hi, honey. I love you. Thank you. Um, and thank you to the company I work for, HashiCorp, for sponsoring my travel to this conference. Um, and you might be, if you're like me, you might be wondering, um, okay, cool logo and cool company name, but what do they actually do? And it took me a while to figure it out, so I'm going to tell you so you don't have to go through that. Um, so HashiCorp has products that fall into four different categories. Infrastructure, where we're trying to automate provisioning, compliance, and management of cloud infrastructure using a common workflow. Um, and we have Packer for machine imaging, Terraform infrastructure as code, uh, security, where uh, you still have to build applications, unfortunately. So we have identity-based security with Vault and then um, secure remote ac access with Boundary. We have some networking apps where um, you can securely connect applications working in any environment, and they really mean any, it's kind of neat. And then um, the applications part. Again, this is about automation and cloud infrastructure and common workflows. So we have Nomad, which handles workflow orchestration, Waypoint, which handles app deployment workflows, and Vagrant, which handles environment workflows. And we're working on unifying these products into the HashiCorp cloud platform. Um, our initial targets are Packer, Consult, Vault, and Terraform, um, making it easier to log into everything all at once, which, you know, makes sense. And we love open source. All of our stuff is open source. Um, so you can go check it out for yourself on GitHub. Not now. Wait till I have to talk. Um, and then um, we ship the UIs with the binaries, which I think is kind of cool. So you can actually go see how we build our Ember apps, like, there. Welcome, everyone, Who, if it's your first time. Um, and if it's your first time watching one of my talks, you'll hear me talk about A11Y. And so I always add this little thing in. Um, accessibility, there's 11 letters between the A and the Y in the word accessibility. So it's like internationalization, right? I, I, H, N, kind of like that. Um, so A11Y is the shortcut. Um, there's going to be four sections. Uh, what is universal design? I've tried to like really scope this to be like what's relevant to the people in this room because it's a rabbit hole, y'all. We could talk about it for like years. And then we're going to look at the principles of universal design and see how they relate to things we already know. And then we're going to talk about universal design in tech and how we could get there as an industry, but more focused for us. And then, of course, action steps. You know I love action steps. So I'm going to give you seven things you can do today. Well, not today, but like pretty soon. Um, so let's dive in. Um, a brief-ish history of universal design, like where to start. Architecture, of course, right? Um, because it's old and cool and, huh, I mean, look at this building. Anyway, the first field where the idea of universal design was written down as an architecture, um, which makes sense because we had like 
wheelchairs before we had the web, right? Like this has been, we've had to access buildings for as long as buildings have existed, right? The first concept of um, universal design is just, you know, on the, the sidewalk on the corner and it goes down and you're like, oh, that's really convenient. I don't have to like worry about breaking my ankle when I step off the curb. Um, the dropped curb or the curb cutout. Um, the architect who came up with this design published a book in 1963 about the concept of designing for everyone instead of tacking on separate adaptions or accommodations uh, for people with disabilities after the fact, which, yeah, makes sense. Uh, in his first book, this architect named Selwyn presented the argument that everyone should have access to buildings and that the requirements for that access should be built in to the initial requirements and not added later. Do you want to pay to build it once or do you want to pay to build it twice? Another architect named Ronald founded the Center for Universal Design and is widely accepted as the pers first person to coin the term universal design. And that was in 1973. He was also responsible for the first legislation in the United States um, in North, the state of North Carolina, which is the first of its type to define the rules related to the accessibility of buildings. Then this, of course, these concepts were dealing with like education and educators realized we could steal some of this or learn from some of this and use it in education. Um, oh, I forgot to take that out. So if I, if I was going to run over, this is the part I was going to chop, but we're going to go through it because um, I was given permission to run over a little bit if I need to, sorry. Um, so in the late 1800s and there, oh wait, first disclaimer, this is about education in, in the United States. Sorry, that's where I live. Um, I will do more work to research it globally, but I didn't have time to before this talk. So please bear with me and thank you for forgiving me for being US centric right now. Um, so in the late 1800s, laws came about that said, hey, you can't send kids to work in factories. You have to send them to school. So they needed to like at scale, send kids to school. And they needed to do that quickly, and you do that with standardization. This is how you got the columns and the rows and the kids sitting there and the teacher in the front and kids falling asleep and all those things. Um, then, around the time of like the Great Depression, they figured out, hey, um, we should have windows in schools. We should let some of the outside in. So the shift focused to like having these, add these big windows to classrooms. And then we had World War II, and um, after that, we had the post-war baby boom. So we had more kids, and we needed more schools for them. So we kind of pulled back from that, uh, hey, how do we innovate for schools? And, like, we need more schools really fast, so let's just standardize and move forward. And then we have, ah, open education classrooms. And this was the idea with taking, taking the walls down making the windows bigger again, putting desks in groups, and then teachers will kind of like walk between classes and sets of children and like educate on a more personal level. Um, and But then we got into, well, we need to save money and we need to um, conserve energy. So let's just take out those big windows because that's costing us too much money and they're not energy efficient. Uh, and let's use um, electric lighting and mechanical air conditioning and helping to save energy. That's what they were trying to do. Um, but then we realized that, oh, why not both? So starting to figure out ways where we could have, meet the needs of the students while staying in the boundaries of budgets, while being energy efficient and um, just realizing that we, we could have all these things at once and it could be, they could be integrated. So um, I think there's a, like a pattern emerging here and you see innovating and pulling back and innovating and pulling back and innovating and pulling back and then like, hey, why not both? The results are paying off. The a study in 2012 was about how classroom design features, actually, like how the room is set up, how much air conditioning or airflow is in the room, the sound of the room, 
the furniture, all of these can influence a student's progress by up to 25%. And if you think about how you were doing in school, like what would 25% have meant to you, right? And for some kids, that's the difference between passing and failing or just being mediocre and really excelling. So just keep these things in your mind because it's gonna matter later. And along the use transitions uh, for the layout of the classroom, universal design was adapted for learning itself. Um, they started to realize that they could use some of the concepts that architecture introduced and provide improved experiences in the classroom for learning. Universal design in learning focuses on areas of action, engagement, and represent representation. Instructors do these things. Identify the desired results, determine acceptable evidence, and plan the learning experience. Now let's talk about that second one, determine acceptable evidence. Um, I don't know about you, but when I went to school, I'm kind of old, when I went to school, you had a test and you passed or failed that test or got like a 99 and then you were mad because you didn't get a hundred or, you know what I mean? Like one of those. Um, and that was it. That's how they knew if you had learned the material. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a really terrible test maker, test taker. No, maker pretty good, taker pretty bad. Um, I don't know what it is. Like I forget my own name. Like horrible it was very uh, tra traumatic i don't know maybe not try but slightly traumatic whatever that word is um and there's a lot of students that are just not very good test takers and so what we're trying to do is like okay what other evidence could a student present or give you that shows you the teacher that they've learned the material because like the test is just a measure what we're really after is making sure the students learn the material Another field that kind of pulls from this is legislature. And over a hundred countries have laws recognizing the rights and responsibilities of disabled people. Now, I was really surprised when I found the list, the like a hundred countries on this list. And I went through and read the legislation because I was like, I don't think I believe you actually. Because like some of these countries, you know, they're doing other stuff that's mm. so, um, but yeah, they're, they're there. So enforcement obviously is key, right? It, you can write all the laws you want, but if you don't actually enforce them, what does it mean? Um, fewer countries have laws or legislation related to digital accessibility, um, but the EU does, the United States does, Britain, Canada, Australia. Oh my gosh, I can't even. So we're getting there. Like it will also be about um, enforcement, but we've got the part that recognizes the rights of people with disabilities across the world. And I think that's really important. Um, so architects first introduced the cut curb. Then we get this, I, the coining of the term universal design. Then we get universal design for learning. And then we get some legislature that actually says, hmm, we need to recognize the rights of people with disabilities. Um, and those are more concrete examples of actually using universal design. And we've got a couple other that are making progress, but they're still kind of in adaptive land. Um, so fashion is one of them. Uh, this outfit is an adaptable kimono or adaptable, it's not a kimono, sorry. There's an, another word for it and I always forget it. So anyway, it's a traditional Japanese garment worn at like ceremonies, so school graduation kind of things. Um, but kids in wheelchairs weren't able to use them because the sleeves get caught in the wheels. So a designer came up with one that had removable sleeves. So you take yourself to the ceremony once you get settled, put your sleeves back on, and then you fit in with the rest of your classmates. It's pretty cool. It would also work if you're just a person who got really hot. Like, you just didn't want sleeves on. Like, oh, that would be useful. Um, and then in 2004, we've got some principles of adaptable fashion coming out um, from a woman named Stephanie Thomas, who's a fashion consultant. And she said, um, 
The clothes have to be accessible to the wearer. They have to be easy to pull on and take off. Uh, they have to be safe um, for the, like, medically. And they have to be fashionable. Like, you shouldn't have to wear sweatpants because you have a disability and that's all you can wear. If you want to dress up, you should be able to do that. That's kind of concept. And her company, Curatable, is working on that. Working on fashion for people who maybe lost a limb or are in a wheelchair. Giving them some options that, like, giving them options, period. And then there's a company uh, called Unhidden Clothing that's doing the same for men's clothing. And these kind of look like normal outfits, right? You wouldn't really be able to tell. But see, up there, the sleeve on the long sleeve shirt, that has um, buttons all the way down. So maybe if you're a patient that has to go through chemotherapy or something, you don't have to wear a different, you can wear that shirt and then just unbutton the sleeves on the outside. It's pretty cool. And then the pants have zipper on the sides or you can put them on like other pants. You have options, again, it's about options. And um, yeah. And then, of course, face masks, because those have become part of our lives in the past few years. And what if you live with someone who needs to read your lips? They need to be able to see your mouth to read your lips, right? Or what if you just want a different way to attach the face mask to your face? Um, a company called Rebirth Garments um, sells these kinds of things. And then in the home goods, and here's, here's the thing. I own these. These are um, pop cap containers. Wait, pop, pop top containers. There we go. Um, and someone pointed out, oh, they're adaptive for people who might only have one hand. It's like, well, I have two hands and I use them all the time. And they're right. You can just pop the top and pull it off, get whatever is in there, put it back on and push the button again. It's done, which is really useful for me because I'm usually like holding one of my cats at home. So I really do only have one arm to use. Um, but I hadn't thought about it. Like, I just think they're super convenient. I didn't consider them, like, an accessibility aid. Um, Pottery Barn sells mirrors with that kilt. So you can have a, if you have a tall, my son is six foot three, so, like, he needs his stuff, like, way up here. And I'm short, so I don't. So having those options is really useful. Um, how many of you have an adjustable height desk? Did you ever consider it to be an accessibility aid? But think about someone in a wheelchair. They could use the desk, and then someone else in their family who isn't can raise the desk up and also use the desk. Another thing I hadn't really thought about as an accessibility thing, but it is. Um, and what if we uh, didn't punish our children for fidgeting, but we gave them in an environment that it was okay to fidget? So they make chairs that kind of quietly move with you, so you could fidget. It's like a fidget spinner chair, <laughs> like almost. And um, that way for kids who just can't sit still, they're not getting yelled at or anything anymore. They're, they're accommodated for. And they can learn better because they're not worried about the stress of that. And weighted blankets. People that have anxiety, weighted blankets are awesome. Um, and then, I don't know. Alexa, there's this whole, like, not just Alexa, and I'm sorry if I'm triggering someone's Alexa right now by saying this. Please forgive me. <laughs> um, these devices can be intrusive, yes. They can also be really helpful. When I'm cooking in the kitchen, I can say, Alexa, add uh, hamburger meat to Target Run, and it will go into my list and add it. So when I'm shopping, I don't have to try to remember. Um, you can check in with your elderly parents if you have them like that. And there's like a lot of uses where we we just didn't have this kind of automated help before, and now we do. The next section, principles of universal design. What are they? There's seven of them. We're going to go through them really quickly because we're going to go through them again after that. Equitable use. The design is useful and marketable to people with diverse abilities. Flexibility in use. The design accommodates a wide range of individual preferences and abilities. Simple and intuitive use. It is the use of the design is easy to understand, regardless of the user's experience, knowledge, language skills, or current concentration level. 
uh, perceptible information. The design communicates necessary information effectively to that user, regardless of the ambient conditions or the user's sensory abilities. Tolerance for error. The design minimizes the bad stuff that can happen of accidental or unintended actions. Low physical effort. The design can be used effectively comfortably and with a minimum of fatigue. Um, think about an automatic door opener versus those doors that like you turn, they get stuck and you push and like, oh my God, you're so tired after that. Appropriate size for use. So um, the example that comes to my head for this one is the adjustable height desk. Like it's universally designed to be it, uh, the appropriate size for anyone to use it. But what are these principles really about? It took me a, a while. Like I was really thinking about this and w watching a lot of TED Talks, a lot of videos, like reading what people thought. And it's about respecting the privacy of the person because you can't always trust um, that the person who's helping you will respect your private data and keep it private. Like we kind of just assume, you know, but if you're someone who needs help, do you have trustworthy help? Not always. So universal design really seeks to respect the privacy of the user. And it's also about dignity. A lot of these products, um, we didn't go into the ones for the uh, aging population, but a lot of these are about allowing folks to exist gracefully. And, uh, and I think that's respecting their dignity as a human. And then it's about offering choice. Um, a lot of the stuff I found like, I'd like to use it actually, be kind of convenient. Um, and I like that I have the choice to use it. So by us, like our, you know, universe, like deciding to offer more choice, we're giving people options and, I, and that's really important. Um, and I think it's about overcoming social conditioning. Um, this is a really great quote by a Japanese uh, fashion designer. And um, do you know buttons were invented in the 1300s? We still use them. Even though we have Velcro, we have pop buttons, we have zippers, we have a lot of different kinds of fasteners, but we're still using buttons. So um, maybe we could rethink that, offer choice, offer more options, kind of... I don't know, upscale. So universal design and tech. We have heuristics um, for interaction design, uh, the most famous of which are the Nelson heuristics. And I've been um, kind of working on this. I had an idea. Okay, so I'm getting pushback from designers about accessibility, the uh, success criteria. Oh, I don't want to do it. Oh, I don't like, I like gray, I like gray. What are you talking about? Everybody loves it. No, they don't. Um, so how do I relate this to information they already have? Design heuristics, these things already exist by someone that's not me. And this is great because I can then say, here's somebody you already respect. Here's things you already know. Guess what, y'all? Uh, so for the principle of equitable use, we have a design heuristic. So we've got the universal design principle. We have a design heuristic that matches it, a match between the real world, between the system and real world. And we have accessibility concepts that also relate. So we're bringing all these things together. And I'm just gonna go through these really quickly and hopefully it will blow your mind. Um, because for each one of these uh, principles that we have, we also have a design heuristic, we also have accessibility principles, and um, I'm going to give you the link to the slide deck later so you can go through them, but I kind of want to keep on track and we've got a lot to cover. Um, but how cool is this, right? So we're like, our worlds are colliding. Um, and that I think we have universal design principles, we have these design heuristics, and we have look at success criteria. What if we thought about success criteria 
as a design tool rather than a constraint. I really want you to like let that sit in your mind, in your subconscious, like send it to one of the back processes. Just think about that for a few days. So in the timeline of innovation and transformations of different fields, I wonder if we're ready to add technology into this timeline. This is my, like, my vision. Ah, there we go. Um, we have a spot. No, we don't. Okay. Uh, but I think it's time. Like, I think we're there. I think we're, we're getting there. We're ready to be there. We're, we understand that it's not just about, oh, you're trying to tell me how to write my code. How dare you? No. We're, we're actually learning from other people in other industries and we're growing and we're recognizing how we fit into the big picture. So, action steps. You ready? Seven things you can do now. BuzzFeed article. Give consistent help. Put a link to help in the same place uh, on your site, visually and in the DOM. Like, I always tell people either stick it in the nav or stick it in the footer, but the same place on all the apps all the time, and it goes to a real person. It could be email address, it could be phone number. Provide help consistently so you're not taking up the user's mental energy while they're trying to use your app. Because search is great, but maybe they're like me and they need more words to describe something, what they're looking for, right? And search is very kind of limiting that way. You have to really get it really right. Number two, um, improve keyboard focus indicators. That's a, that's a good one. And I don't think this next slide actually works. Oh, it does, good. So here's some examples of um, keyboard focus indicators that are great and may or may not resemble something in my current design system. Um, but we've got some interesting things here. We have a double border. We have a just a two pixel look. So this is the thing, bump it up to two pixels, make it solid. If you wanna use dashed, bump it up to four. If you wanna do one on the side, bump it up to four. Um, and get that three to one contrast ratio between the button and the border and the border and the background. So there's a, that double three to one check here. But all of these examples pass. So, you know, take a mental picture. Um, number three, provide multiple ways for a user to authenticate. I know, it's so, you're like, no, that's too much work. But, okay, um, don't, don't, I will hunt you down uh, if you do this. Do not prohibit copy, paste, or password managers. I will hunt you down if you do this. Uh, <laughs> that is one of the most frustrating, when I'm filling out a form and they've prevented copy, you, like, string of bad words here, like, very upsetting. You can use the, um, help train my AI tests, identify all images of cats in this picture, right? Um, but if you do that, you really need to provide, either they can um, listen, like give them an alternate way to do that or, or get some help. Um, login links instead of memorizing a password and a username. And there's more, but the point is we wanna give our users options so they can pick the way that fits best for them. Um, number four, improve the target sizes of your interactives. Um, I'm, I'm going to preach this one until we all do it. Um, what we're going for here, ideally, those of us who have on, on the Fat Finger Brigade will tell you that we would love to have 44 by 44 pixel top targets, right? But it also helps mouse users who maybe had too much coffee. <laughs> they're kind of jittery, and you give them that tiny tap, and they're like, oh my god, I can't. And they click on the wrong thing. Um, but 24 by 24 for now passes. Or 
you can do maps. Like we're after the total target size and the spacing in between. So if you're not gonna put spacing, it needs to be a little bigger. If you put some spacing, you can make it a little smaller. We're after total target size. Um, number five, re reveal your forms for places where you've asked users to fill in information twice. The only place that this is like legit is like setting a new password. Yeah, okay, we want to make sure you, you really meant that password, right? Um, but what about billing and shipping? Have you ever had to fill that same information in twice? Like, just give me a checkbox. Let me say my billing information is the same as my shipping. Um, that one makes me cranky. Um, if you're at work and you know that the user's already given you like their work ID or whatever, pre-fill that in the form. Allow them to change it. Don't lock that down, but pre-fill it in for them so they don't have to tell you that again, that you already know. And then um, pre-fill search inputs. Now, we work on technical applications. We work with secure data sometimes. So you might have to do this by session. Um, and it's even fine to do like a drop down list of options for things that they've entered, that kind of thing. But you could help them out. Um, number six, be proactive about accessibility at work. Obviously, I'm going to tell you that. I mean, of course, you were expecting that to be on the list. Um, but I've made a little website to help you. Please fund A11Y.com is how to fund accessibility work. Because what I found is a lot of people say, well, we'd like to, but what? How like, it seems very vague and ambiguous. And nope, not anymore. I have given, if you were to visit this website, you would see it's a list of rationalizations, what to fund, how your business benefits, uh, and all that kind of stuff. So um, bother somebody until they put money into accessibility work. And you were also probably expecting this from me. Use the automation we already have. So we get Ember template lint, and we have some other linting options, but you get that one for free in new Ember apps. Um, and there's Ember a little more testing. And even if you use different frameworks now, um, I've done a little side project. It's my baby. Um, and thank you to people in this room who have actually participated. Um, it's an accessibility automation tracker. What? what accessibility automation already exists. And it's good for our business because it increases our potential customer reach and it can increase our active user engagement. So it's good for our business, but it's also great for our users. And that's what we're after, to do what it takes to build inclusive experiences for everyone. And just in closing, um, Mel's PSA for life, you do not require permission to write accessible code. It is a facet of your craft. It is a signal of your knowledge and expertise. Learn it, do it. I'm here to help. Thank you for listening.